Good evening, everyone. I want to share with you the uh, Sunday school lesson for this Sunday and hope that uh, something will be said or done that will allow God to get the glory that he deserves. Let us go to God in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come, Lord, first to say thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord. We realize, Father God, that you have been so much better to us than we deserve, and we just want to humbly come before you to say thank you for it, God. I pray now, God, for your anointing, God, for your insight as we study this lesson together to learn more of you, God. But as we get this lesson, as it go through our ears, God, let it find a larger place in our hearts, God, so that we won't sin against you, God, and so that we will live the word, God, not only hear the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I do want to honor my pastor today, um, Pastor Jeffrey Williams and Lady Monique Williams. Um, they are my leaders, and I thank God for them, and I thank God for the opportunity to teach this Sunday school lesson. Our Sunday school lesson this week is um, entitled Measure Up, and it's, uh, the unifying topic is Return to Love and Justice. And the main thought is, therefore, turn thou to thy God. Keep mercy and judgment and wait on thy God continually. It's Hosea, the 12th chapter and the 6th verse. That's the King James Version. And our lesson is coming from Hosea's chapter 11 and 12. And it's ironic that um, today uh, we're dealing with Hosea. One, because of so much calamity that's going on in the world and and God is trying to bring Israel back to a place of love, uh, a love relationship with him. And I believe with everything that's in me, what's going on with us today, God is trying to bring us back to a love relationship with him. Because we fell out of love with God. We've, we've gone our ways and did what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. And we have truly fell out of love with God. And God's not going to have it. He'll do what he has to do to get us to a place um, where we're back in love with him because he is a jealous God. And uh, not only he's a jealous God, he said we're not going to have anything, any God or, or anyone or anybody before him. And if we do, God has a way of moving it or them out of the way. And, and he can do it because he's God. Um, again, our lesson comes from Hosea. And Hosea was a mighty prophet, and his ministry began near the end of the period of the military success and prosperity for Israel and Judah. And also, Hosea's job as a prophet was to expose the nation's breach of covenant and announce God's intention to implement the covenant curses. The three things that Hosea deals with is sin, judgment, and salvation. And those are three things that God deals with through the prophet Hosea. And, and in this time, <laughs> um, it, it looks like uh, so much of what we're going through today because Hosea is um, prophesying during a time where Israel was coming out of a successful period in their life. And it looks like sometimes um, we can look in the mirror and see ourselves as we see Israel. Sometimes we get a victory or something. Things are going great in our life. And then we just forget about God. We just go on and do things our way. But, but this is what's happening. This is what's happening in Hosea chapters 11 and 12. But we'll see that God has a way of bringing us back and letting us know who's in charge. He does that. So we're going to read um, King James Version. And Hosea, the 11th chapter, we're going to begin with verse 1 and 2. And it says, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. And they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam and burned incense to graven image. Now, this first two verses is what the beginning of the relationship was like. Um, the relationship of God and Israel was like a father and a son relationship because God had a strong love for Israel. He, they were God's chosen people and he loved them so much. But now that God is using Hosea to cause them 
to call them into obedience, I'm sorry, they rejected him because of what the prophet told them that God said. They rejected him. And what they did after they rejected him, it says they made sacrifice unto Balaam. So they turned to false gods. And not only was God rejected, but the people literally turned their backs on God, serving graven images and and false gods. And God, God was not pleased with that. And one thing we can be sure, when we stray away from God, there are consequences when we stray away from the God we serve because God gives out his love so freely. He takes care of us so freely. His grace and mercy is just so awesome in our lives. And he loves us so much until he'll do what he has to do to get our, our attention and bring us back where we should be with him. So... In those first two verses, it, it tells you it, it, from the beginning. It, it's nothing new. From the beginning, my love was so great for Israel. And they turned that back on me because of the word I sent to them through the prophet. And many times, as, as our pastor, I know sometimes when Pastor Williams is preaching, it'll make me take a good look at myself. And, and I'll just have to say, ouch, and God just helped me because... I'm not going to turn away from God. I, I don't care how bad the word chastises me. I don't care how bad the word lets me know that I'm not where I think I am. I, I, I'm not as big of a girl as I think I am. And, and I can't walk in this space like I think I can. God will remind us that we can't do anything without him. And I'm so thankful that we serve that kind of God. And, and sometimes that's what... Um, the prophets, the, the ministers, the pastors of today are doing. They're calling us back to our love relationship with God. He, he calling us back to total dependency because that's what God wants. He wants us to totally depend on him and nobody else. Not our jobs, not our spouses, not any uh, of the material things, our homes, our cars. He wants us to be totally dependent on him. And that's what we need to be. Okay, and verses 7 Seven and eight, and my people are bent to backsliding from me. Though they call them to the most high, none at all would exalt him. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Atma? How shall I set thee as Zaboam? Mine heart is turned within me. My repentance, my repentings are kindled together. Now, uh, the Lord is saying, uh, you all are determined that you're going to turn away from me. And it hurts. It, it we hurt God. Sometimes I believe that we make God cry. He repent. He, he hates the fact that we do what we do when we were created to worship him. That, that's all we were created for. But sometimes we go in a different direction and we do our own thing and we don't do what God wants us to do. So he let it, we're bent to backsliding. But and won't exalt him, won't give him the glory and the honor that he's worthy of. But why? Why do we try and steal God's glory? That's a question we need to, to meditate and, and eat on for a little while. Why do we try to steal God's glory? Because the glory only belongs to him. It doesn't belong to us. Okay? And then he, uh, he came back with, with four rhetorical questions. He said, how shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How can I give up something that I love so much that I created for, for my very own people that are called my very own? I delivered you from, from Egypt and took you into the promised land. How can I give you up? My love and my trust is, is in you knowing that you will do right. He says that God got it. He has a remnant in these people. It means that he have a certain amount of people that he knows is going to serve him. And give him the glory. And that's still the same way today. You can go into churches. You can go into, in, the, in the different concerts and different places. And you can see those who are sincere and who are really into God and who really want to give God the glory. Not for any show, form, or fashion, but to praise God and give him the glory that he's worthy of. He said, how can I give you up? How can I do that? Not only that, then he said, how shall I deliver thee? How am I going to allow you to get out of this one? How shall I set thee as Zeboam? 
my heart is turned within me. My repentance are, because he said, I can't, do, even though I want to, I can't destroy you totally like I did Sodom and Gomorrah and some of the other places in the past, like I did with Moses in the flood. I'm sorry, with Noah in the flood. And some of the other places that I um, totally destroyed. He said, how can I do this to you? You're my love. You're my chosen people. You've done enough for me to do it. You've turned your back on me enough for me to give you. I'm not going to do you the way I did them, but I am going to punish you. You can be sure that your sins will find you out. That whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. And God is letting them know, I'm not going to do you like I did them, but I am going to punish you. But at the same time, when we see punishment and calamity going on around us, and it tells us in Psalms 91, a thousand, uh, 10,000 shall fall at our right side, but it won't come near us. God has a remnant of people still in this lesson that he's going to save. The destruction is not going to touch them, but he is going to destroy those that were disobedient and turned against him and served idol gods. He's the same God. He hasn't changed. He's, he's going to do that today. He's going to handle you and I the same way he handled the children of Israel. Just like they were his chosen people, so are we. The Christians are God's chosen people. He said, I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man. The Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. He said, I, I'm not going to let, as I said, he said, I'm not going to let my fierce anger go on you. Hey, I'm not going to let it go like you deserve. I'm going to give you a break. Say, but just know, I'm coming for you. And he said, they shall walk after the Lord. He shall not roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. Now, the, the, when you talk about the symbol of, the symbol of the lion in the scriptures, it's normally talking about judgment and destruction. But he tells them here, he said, he shall not roar like the lion. He said, I'm not going to cause total destruction and judgment this time. He said, I'm, I'm going to spare you this time. But he said, but when I come back to restore you, you you're going to follow me. You're going to follow me and you're going to be led by me. You're going, you're going to do the things that I tell you to do because when I'm done with you, you're going to hear what I'm saying. And it's sad sometimes that we can't hear God. We won't do what God tell us to do. We won't say what God tell us to say until we flat on our back and we don't have a choice. That's not the way God wanted it to happen. So we got to keep in mind that God wants us to do what's right, to do right by him. And we have to learn to do that because he is so worthy. He is so worthy. Now let's go to um, Hosea chapter 12. We're going to deal with the first two verses, one and two. It said, Ephraim feedeth on wind and followeth after the east wind. He daily increased lies and desolations and they do make a covenant with the Assyrians, and oil is carried into Egypt. The Lord hath also a controversy with Judah, and will punish Jacob according to his ways, according to his doings, will he recompense him. Okay, so at first verse saying you're, you're following after Assyria, Assyria and Egypt, and, and they, they actually use the olive oil. And they use the olive oil for like covenant making and the ceremonies. And it was even given as a token of allegiance. But God was saying, oh, why you? I don't know why you're using the olive oil. Because everything you're doing now is futile and it's self-destructive. Because it's not of me. It doesn't symbolize who I am. It doesn't symbolize what I stand for. So what you're doing with the oil is in vain. It's not doing you any good. And then, then number two lets us know that God had a charge against Judah. He said, I'm about to punish you for your evil ways. He said, you have to be punished for your evil ways. And look how he compared them to Jacob. Jacob was a, a, a trickery. His name means trickery. Jacob was deceitful. He was deceitful even in the womb. 
he held on to his brother's um, ankle while they were in the womb, stole his brother's birthright, tricked his father, um, wrestled with the angels until his hip was pulled out of the socket. Jacob was full of trickery. And that God is comparing the children of Israel at this time, the way that they were doing, worshiping out of gods and going about doing their own things, he's comparing them to Jacob. Now, sometimes it's okay to compare us to some people, but some people we don't want to be compared to. Some people we don't want to be associated with because, uh, because they don't look like God, they don't talk like God, they don't walk like God, and they don't imitate God. God said, it, it says in the scriptures, in Galatians, I can't remember the exact chapter, that we should be imitators of Christ. We should imitate everything he does. What he hate, we should hate. What he loved, we should love. How he walked and talked and loved, that's what we should do. So um, he compared them here to Jacob. Oh, deceitful. Oh, deceitful boy. Full of trickery. Always up to something. Okay, so uh, verse 6 and 7 says, Therefore, turn thou to thy God, keep mercy and judgment, and wait on thy God continually. He is a merchant, the balances of deceit are in his hand. He loveth to oppress. He said, I need to see some genuine repentance. And, and when you genuinely, when we genuinely repent and turn away, when we turn away from the things we repent from, we should turn to God. Because if you turn away from something, that means you're turning to something else. So don't turn to something else deceitful. Don't turn to something else sinful. Don't turn to something else out of the will of God. When you turn away from your sin, when you turn away from your worship and out of God's, when you turn away from your disobedience and all the things that don't please God, turn to God. And when you turn to God, it involves you having a real spirit of love and commitment. Because God is nothing but love. Everything about God is love. And we've got to learn to turn to and rely on God rather than ourselves. And he tell them too, he said, your attitudes and your dealings have to have a complete reversal. He's like, because your attitude and everything is messed up. I, I'm not going to deal with it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put it down because I don't have to deal with it. God doesn't have to deal with our stank attitudes. You know how sometimes we come into church... And and people will say good morning and, and how are you and people want to love on you and you have the worst attitude. You're not today. I, I'm I'm in my feelings today or whatever. You should have left all of that outside or you should have carried it to the altar or wherever you need wherever you lay your burdens down or however you get into your secret place, you should have did all that before you came into the body of Christ. That shouldn't be, you should, you, you bring in more spirits in the house of God for us to deal with and fight with. If we're going to be imitators of Christ, we're going to have to go back to that love because love is truly what we're missing. We, we, we gotta, we have lip service. We'll tell somebody it, that word love is thrown around so much, but it doesn't hold meaning for most people. But when we tell somebody that we love them, we should mean it from our heart, that we love them with agape love, with a glove. There are no conditions to my love. I'm going to love you even if you don't love me. I'm going to treat you good. I'm going to do you right. I'm, I'm going to meet your need if I can. And whatever I need to do for you that's going to help you get closer to the Lord, that's what I'm going to do for you. Whether you love me or not, whether you accept it or not, I'm going to try to give it to you because somebody had to do it with me. So we got to get back to love. We have got to get back to love. Um, it said he's a merchant. The balances of deceit are in his hand and he's lust to oppress. You know, um, they're, they're talking about the scales. You know, the Old, Test the Old Testament always spoke of the scales because back in those days, the scales were rigged. Uh, where they could weigh less than what the the buyer was actually getting, so there was compared them to trickery again. Again, it's comparing them to trickery and and, and deceit. And, and he's letting them know that I see you, I see you. We've been talking about. Our pastor was talking about early in a, a few of his sermons how um, 
God is unveiling. He is pulling the covers back. And this pandemic is really showing us who we are, what we stand for, and where we stand with God. Mm -hmm. and, and most of our lives, the rubble has met the road. And we're, we're seeing who really want to serve God with all their heart, mind, and soul. I think about the songwriter, Shekinah Glory, when he said, God, if God told you what he really needed from you, would you still say yes? I really would. I really would. Because I, all I want is God. All I want is God. I want to be like him. I want to walk like him. I want to love like him because that's what he's doing. He wants us to return to God and return to the love that God instilled in us. When he called us, caused us to be his children, when he brought us out of the darkness into the marvelous light, we've got to get back to love. That's what this lesson is telling us. We've got to get back to love and we've got to get back to unity because there is truly power in unity. That Pentecost Sunday that we'll celebrate on Sunday, that Pentecost that we're going to celebrate, um, they couldn't do Pentecost. It, it would not have been a Pentecost if they were not all on one accord in one place with one mind to tarry and wait on the Lord and wait on his promises. And if we get in that place, we can have a Pentecost, a good time in the name of the Lord, because he's still the same God. I still believe that. He's still the same God and he doesn't change. So we can still have Pentecost on Sunday. And verse eight says, and Ephraim said, yet I am become rich. I have found me out substance in all my labors. They shall find none iniquity in me that were sin. And I that am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt will yet make thee to dwell in tabernacles as in the days of the solemn feast. You know, um, they thought that their wealth would allow them to hide their sins. It doesn't matter how much money you pay in church. It doesn't matter how less money you pay in church. It doesn't matter how much time you spend doing the work of the Lord. It doesn't matter how much time you spend at church singing on the choir, on the usher, on the culinary ministry, or whatever ministry you're in. It does not matter how much you do on that ministry. If your heart is not right and your heart and your entire being is not turned toward God, everything you're doing is in vain. Your wealth will not be able to hide your sins. Your work won't be able to hide your sins. God can see just as good in the night as he can in the day. It doesn't matter if I can't see you, if your pastor can't see you, if, if, if nobody can see you, God sees you. He sees it all. And as pastor has said earlier too, we can't continue to drink, smoke, cuss, commit adultery, fornicate, and do all this different stuff. And then we still want to teach and preach and sing on the choir. What, what you want to spill over that all, all of that mess over into other people for? You should go somewhere and sit down until God get finished with you. He get finished delivering you to a place where you can truly be used by God. We all know where we are with God. We, we, know, we know what uh, our secret sins are. And it doesn't matter how anybody want to appoint you and put you in a place. You should be humble enough and have enough fear and reverence of God to say, I'm not ready. My life is not where it needs to be. I'm not ready to be in that place. I'm not worthy to be in that place. The blood made us worthy. But if we stay under the blood, we can stay worthy. I didn't say stay perfect, but if we stay under the blood, we can stay worthy. When we purposely sin and purposely have a way of life outside of the church, not reflecting the way of life that we claim we have when we're inside of the church, you're double-minded and you're unstable in all your ways. And that's the word of God. Get back to the love. Stop trying to hide behind your wealth and your work because it won't work. It won't work. And he said, and I that am Lord, I that am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt will yet make thee to dwell in tabernacles as in the day of the solemn feast. He said, um, I'm going to do again what I did the first time. I'm not going to look over your, in, I'm not going to look over your disobedience. I'm not going to look over your ingratitude. 
He said, I took you through the wilderness and, and to the promised land. And I'm going to take you into the wilderness again. And you're going to have to live in the tents. And, and you're going to realize one more time, here we go again. We're in exile again. And it's nobody's fault but your own. You're disobedient. The same reason you got in there the first time. Disobedience. Complaining. Serving out of God. He said, I'm going to put you back in the same place again. And I'm telling you, you do not want to fall into the hands of an angry God. You need to repent, do what's right, and stay in the will of God. Because that's all God wants from us. He wants us to totally depend on him, to totally love on him. To everything that we need, we come to him before we go to anybody else. Because he is able to supply all of our needs. He promised us that. And he keeps his promises. And he said, 10 says, I have also spoken by the prophets and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Is there iniquity, is there iniquity in Gilead? Surely they are vanity. They sacrifice bullocks in Gilgal. Yea, their altars are as heaps in the furrows of the fields. Look at that. He's saying, I've, I've communicated with you and, and I've talked to you through the prophets, but you wouldn't listen. You, you rejected everything they said. He said you kept working with your hypocrisy, your wickedness, and everything that you did, it manifested in Gilead and Gilgal. He said, but what's going to come next? It's just like Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king horses and all the king men couldn't put Humpty together again. It's going to come down. It's going to come down like, like a pile of rubble. That's what the scripture there is. It says, as heaps and furrows of the fields. It, it, it's not going to work. It is not going to work. How many times does the men and women of God have to cry loud and spare not, repent, and be baptized, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Repent and be baptized, for the day of the Lord is at hand. God is soon to return. He is soon to return, and he is going to do us just like he did Israel, because we're no better than they are. We are no better than they are. We're still his chosen people. He said here in 12, and Jacob fled into the country of Syria, and Israel served for a wife, and for a wife he kept sheep. And by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet was he preserved. And listen, he compared them to Jacob again. That like Jacob fled into the country of Syria and wanted a wife, but the wife he wanted, he had to go out there and keep them sheep longer than he wanted to keep them before he could get that wife. You see, when you go outside of the will of God, you may not run into adversity. You may not run into a brick wall today. But you will run into a place where you're going to have to surrender. And you're going to have to surrender everything. You're going to have to surrender everything to God. He compared them to Jacob again. He said he flew there, but he had to serve for that wife. And he had to keep the sheep for them wife. Yeah, Jacob had to do that. He had to keep the sheep for that why. He's saying, by the prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by the prophet was he preserved. Now look at that. He said, he, he's calling his goodness again. Um, Jacob was once a refugee, but now look at him. And he, he's telling them too, they delivered, they served they had to serve until God delivered them. And he said, I'm going to make you serve until I deliver you. Because you turned away from me. You turned your back on me. You know how it feels? Some of you may not, but I do. You know how it feels when you have given your everything? When you have tried everything you know how to try. Uh, you've been the best person you know how to be. You've been a giver. You've you've committed yourself. You've 
Surrender yourself. You've been virtuous in your marriage. You've been uh, virtuous in your commitments to God. All of that. But then it, you turn around and get slapped in the face for doing the best that you can do. Do you really know how that feels? Think about how God feels. Think about how God feels when we, he gives us so much. God gives us so much. And then we turn our back on him and we just slap him in the face. We literally slap him in the face and say, huh, here you go. I, I know you brought me out. I know you healed my body. I know you delivered me from cancer, diabetes, uh, high blood pressure. I know that you did this for me. But I don't have time for you. I'm not going to serve you. I'm not going to worship you. I'm not going to love the people like you. I'm not going to love my neighbor as myself. I'm not doing any of the commandments that you laid on me. That's what we're telling God when we don't do, when we don't obey him, when we don't follow his commandments, when we don't love one another. Again, as I said earlier, everything about God is love. And that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to just love on each other. And he's the ultimate example. He's the greatest example we can have. He is the greatest example we can have. And it says, Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly. Therefore shall he leave his blood upon him, and his reproach shall his Lord return unto him. Mm. Ephraim really offended God. And they insulted God by the things that they did and said and by worshiping out of God. But God said, yep, you did it. But now it's time to pay the piper. You did it, so you're going to have to suffer the consequences. They provoked God to anger with their sins. And, and Hosea was just saying, don't, don't, don't play with God. Your arms are too short to box with him. You'll never win. There's no way you will win. You can't get in the ring with God and think that you're going to win. But what God was saying, because of what you've done to me, I'm not going to extend you any forgiveness for this. I'm going to leave this guilt upon you, and I'm going to punish you for the guilt. I am going to repay you for the evil that you have done. God is a just God. He's loving. He's kind. He's patient. He's merciful. But he's also a God of judgment. Don't ever think that you can turn your back on God and do what you want to do and there's not going to be any consequences. You got to go back to God, return back to God, return back to the love and because he's calling us in love. And what Hosea was telling us, all God wants is for us to love him and obey him and love one another. Give him the attention and, and the love, the praise and the worship that he deserves because he is God. And besides him, there is none other. So that concludes our lesson. Um, that was um, Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 and 2 and 7 through 10. And then Hosea chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 and 6 through 14. And again, I pray that something has been said that help you understand the scriptures better. And to God be the glory for the great things that he has done. God bless you.